no other king could vanquish the war horse or silence the warrior's rage while riding the lowly back of a donkey. No other king could break the dominion of darkness, the tyranny of evil, with a reign of grace and a kingdom of peace. No other king could give his life for the redemption of rebels, his wealth to welcome the outcast. Jesus is that king, the king of glory, son of the living God. Not just another king, not just another prophet, not just another teacher. He was the one the world had been waiting for. The one to deliver us from captivity, the son of David and Abraham's chosen seed. He is the goal of the Mosaic law, Yahweh in the flesh. He is the one to establish God's reign and rule, to heal the sick, give sight to the blind, freedom to the prisoners, and proclaim good news to the poor. This Jesus was the creator come to earth and the beginning of a new creation. He embodied the covenant, fulfilled the commandments, and reversed the curse. This Jesus is the Christ that God spoke of to the serpent, the one prefigured to Noah in the flood, the one promised to Abraham, the one guaranteed to Moses before he died, the one promised to David during his reign, the one revealed to Isaiah as a suffering servant, the one predicted through the prophets and prepared for through John the Baptist. He is the Father's Son, Savior of the world, and substitute for our sins. More loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. How you doing? Come on, let's stand together. Let's worship our King. Come on.
is exalted, the King is exalted on high. And I will praise Him, He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise Him. great things he is exalted his word says that therefore God exalted him meaning Jesus to the highest place and gave him meaning Jesus the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father welcome to the gathering uh, some of you might be going, who in the world is this guy? Um, so if you don't know me, my name is Sean. I am the worship director here at Redeemer Bible Church. These are my friends. We are excited to be leading uh, with you guys tonight, worshiping alongside of you guys uh, tonight. And we're just going to continue to sing. And then Pastor Jeremiah is going to come up and, and lead us in, in the teaching of God's word. But before we continue in our worship... I want to read Psalm 130 for you. It says this, out of, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? 
but with you there is forgiveness so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than the watchman wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Church, that is good news. And the truth is, he has redeemed us of all of our sins by sending his son, Jesus, to be the propitiation for our sins and not just for our sins, but for the sins of the whole world. And I don't know about you, church. I'm going to rejoice in that. I'm going to stand. I'm going to lift my hands. I'm going to proclaim it. I'm going to shout it from the rooftops because this King Jesus has redeemed us. Amen. Let's go to him. Yes. Amen. It's okay to cheer. It's okay to sing. It's okay to lift your hands. Let's have that joy. Just like Jeremiah. There's a passage in Jeremiah where he talks about this fire in his bones that he's so excited about God's word that he will rely on God's word that even if he tried to, to hold it in and not proclaim it, he couldn't. It was like a fire burning in his bones. So let's have that joy this evening as we continue to worship and hear from his word. Let me pray for our time and we'll continue to sing. Oh, great God of highest heaven, occupy our oh, lowly hearts. Own it all and reign supreme. God, we love you. That's why we stand here in this place. That's why we sing. That's why we shout. That's why we clap. Because you are a good and gracious king, worthy of all of our praise. We love you, Lord. I thank you for this time. I thank you for this group of people in this place. Stir our affections tonight for your son. We love you. It's in your holy, precious name we pray. Amen.
has come to take away And God himself has paid the price That all who trust in him today Find healing in his sacrifice That all who trust in him today
2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Church, that is good news. Let's proclaim this last verse together. Pardon for sin and a peace that endureth. Let's sing that out. The Golden Gate Bridge is one of the longest suspension bridges in the world. Located in San Francisco, it's some 9,000 feet long, and it hangs approximately 256 feet in the air. They started construction back in the 1930s, and it had a rather inauspicious beginning. You see, at the beginning... Several workmen fell off their perch as they were working on the bridge and tumbled to their death in the waters below. As you can imagine, with workmen dying, everyone was scared, so work slowed down tremendously because they didn't have the necessary safety equipment. And so this, the project got behind schedule. And they didn't know what to do to provide safety and security for these workers until the chief engineer came up with a solution. He said this, why don't we construct a safety net under the bridge? So the areas where they're working, if they fall, they'll fall into the rope netting and they'll be okay. Well, the plan sounded good, so they implemented it and the effect was immediate. The workers no longer had to fear falling to their death so they could work quickly, they could work efficiently. And the project soon moved forward, it advanced, and they completed it in 1937, ahead of schedule. And just as for the Golden Gate Bridge, just as that rope netting underneath the bridge instilled confidence in the workers and gave them a security for their work, so Psalm 91 instills confidence and courage in the believer. See, Psalm 91 is better than a rope net because Psalm 91 is built upon the unfailing, unfaltering power of God. And in Psalm 91, we see that the believer, the true Christian, the one who is in Christ, who's repented and placed his faith, her faith in Christ, has an unshakable security in God. And so even though we don't even know what occasioned this psalm, we don't know the setting that caused the psalmist to write it, it's anonymously written, what we do know is this. This psalm provides an unshakable foundation for the Christian's life. To march forward confidently despite whatever threats, whatever dangers, whatever opposition comes in your life, you can believe and you can bank on the fact that God is is your perfect security. That's what Psalm 91 is all about. The absolute security that God provides for his children. 
And we'll see that this security is grounded in three unshakable realities. If you're taking notes, this is for you. Three unshakable realities. Number one, God's character. Number two, God's care. And then number three, the third unshakable reality that gives you a confident security is God's commitment. So that'll be our outline this evening as we explore the absolute security that God provides to his children. So we'll look at the first one, God's character, and it's in verses one and two. Let me go ahead and read that to refresh your memory real fast. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Here in these first two verses, the psalmist is making this bold declaration of his personal confidence in God. And I want you to know that this is a confidence not rooted in his, himself or anything else, but the very character of God. So he says, I can trust in the Lord because I know this God. And we'll see that because he gives four distinct names for God in the first two verses. And in the Bible, a name had important meaning. So in ancient times, a name identified that person's essence. It was more than just a title for getting somebody's attention. A name was intertwined intimately with who that person was, with his character. So a name said something about a person. So when the psalmist gives four different names in two verses, he's saying, I know this God. That's why I have confidence in him. So let's explore that. Two names come in verse one. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And we find that there is this idea of safety and security in the presence of God. And that first name is the Most High. And that's a name that speaks of God's strength, of his absolute sovereignty. As he's the God who is over all God, over all God's. And so no wonder the psalmist is secure and the most high because he's higher than all other gods. And then he says, the one who dwells will also abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And the Almighty speaks of God's unlimited power. He can do whatever he wants. And so there's no enemy who could overcome or overwhelm God. So his protection of the Christian is absolutely guaranteed and assured because his power is perfect. And then he moves in verse 2, and he moves from this principle that the believer is secure in God to a personal declaration. Notice how he speaks in the first person. He says, I. He says, I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And I want you to notice that triple repetition of the personal pronoun, my. My refuge, my fortress, my God. See, the reason the psalmist has such confidence in God's security is because not only does he know his God, but because it is a personal God. See, this is not the God that we worship as Christians. He's not a distant deity. He's not indifferent to our life. He didn't just make us then wander off to do his own thing. He is near, he is close, he is personal. And so the psalmist says, I know that by experience. That's why he's my refuge, my fortress, which means a place of security. A refuge is where you run when you're afraid, when enemies are chasing you. And a fortress is, is that, it's a castle, it's a stronghold, a place with high walls and thick, uh, thick walls and a strong gate. And you go inside the gates of that fortress and you're safe. And he says, that's my God. And he uses another name. He says, the Lord, which is in all caps, which tells you that this is the covenant name of God. The covenant name that speaks of his personal nature, that he is a God who is near to his people. He's a God who makes covenant and promises to his people and he keeps his promises. And so the psalmist, his confidence is born out of a deep knowledge of the Almighty and out of that personal nature of God. 
And then he gives one final title for God. He says, my God. And that is a name that speaks of God as, as the highest, the most powerful, the one with all the might, the supreme deity. And so he says, this is the God in whom I trust. My God is not a demigod, a little God. He's not one of many gods. He's the God of gods. He's the God above all gods. He's the God with absolute unlimited power. And so I'm going to place my trust in this God. And moreover, he's a personal God. He's a God that you can know. He's a God that wants to know you. And so he says, my confidence, my security is rooted and grounded like a tree in the soil of God's character. I won't be shaken because, because I know this God and he's knowable. And I think today what we are so sorely lacking in the American church is a knowledge of God. We have such weak preaching and now we think our God is so weak and we don't know him. We don't know his character. And so when life gets really hard and things, bad things come at us because we don't know our God, we don't know that he's the almighty. We don't know that he's perfectly trustworthy, that he's perfectly faithful, that he's near to us, that he wants a relationship with us. When we don't know these things, we turn to all kinds of other fortresses in our life. We don't run to him, we run to money. We say, no, no, my security is my bank account. Now, that's probably not true for high schoolers, right? But maybe if you've got a job and you're finally earning an income, you're like, oh, yeah, I, I've got security now that I have money. Or you say, my security, my fortress, the one I run to, it's my family. Because I can always trust them. And they're always there for me. And so my instinct isn't to run to God, it's to run to my family. And that's my fortress. Because I know them and they know me. Some people say, well, mine is maybe pornography. That's the, that's the refuge I can always turn to. Never lets me down. Always available. And those images are waiting for me. So, so when life gets really crummy, I can run to that fortress of pornography. And there are so many other fortresses that this world would say, Turn here. Find safety here. Find security here. But the psalmist says, no, 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 no. There is no shelter more secure than the Almighty, than the God of gods. And if you want to experience and know the security of what it is to walk with him, then you must know him. You must know him intimately, his character, his ways, his nature, how he operates. And so the psalmist says, my trust is rooted in that. I'm secure, not because of me, I'm secure because of this God and his character. That leads us to our second reality here, the second stabilizing reality for the believer that provides security and we move from God's character to God's care. And that's verses 3 to 13. From God's character to his care. And in verses 3 to 13, the psalmist gives this massive list of the dangers that this life offers. The different threatening dangers that will come at you. Come unsuspected. Come when you're not looking for it. When it's just a nice sunny day and then boom, out of nowhere comes bad news, comes some threatening thing. And then the psalmist says, life is full of trouble. Life is full of danger. Life is full of problems. But the care of God is the security net beneath you. Starting in verse 3, he says, for it is he who delivers you from the snare of the trapper. And before we even think of what is the snare of the trapper, I just want you to know that when it says, it is he, you should know that's emphatic. It's like he says, the one who delivers you, it's God, it's only God, it's him alone. So just in case there's any doubt, I want you to know the one who's going to deliver you, believer, it's that God I was talking about in verses one and two. It's him. 
And he'll deliver you and he gives two dangers in verse three. The snare of the trapper and the deadly pestilence. The snare of the trapper has the image of a hunter. He's laying traps in the forest to catch that animal unsuspecting. And a snare is something you don't see because if the animal saw it, it wouldn't get caught. And so these are hidden dangers. Something that a strong person can get caught with. Something that a weak person can't get caught in. And he says he delivers you, he rescues you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. And that could be any kind of disease, physical malady, some kind of epidemic or plague. I mean, just think of our day, right? COVID. So it says, our God can deliver you from any kind of physical disease, any kind of physical threat. And then verse four, he gives us beautiful imagery. He says, he will cover you with his pinions and under his wings you may seek refuge. Pinions and wings, that has the idea of a mother hen, right? Who, who when her little chicks are scared, they run to her and she opens her wings and she, she draws them close and she shelters them under her wings, right next to her body, close to her as possible. And so this is affection, this is compassion, this is care. And the psalmist is saying, this is what God does for his people. When you run to him, he doesn't turn you away. He doesn't look down on you and say, you're so weak, you're so pathetic. No, he says, I will draw you close. I put you right next to my chest. And I'll, I'll protect you. And then he sort of switches the imagery in the latter half of verse four and he says his faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. Now God is a warrior. Now God has this massive full body shield and he says I will block the arrows and the slings of the enemy. You get behind me, I'll protect you. No harm will come to you. I will sort of, you could say, encompass or envelop you with my protective care. Because God's compassion and his care is matched by his strength and his power. And he says, these come together in this perfect wall of protection for the believer. That's why he says in verse 5, you will not be afraid. And then he lists in verses 5 and 6, four more dangers that God protects you from. And just let me explain a little bit that phrase, you will not be afraid. So he's saying... Not only do you not have to fear the danger itself, because God's going to protect you. You don't even have to enter into the emotional state of being afraid. Because the original grammar is, you will never become afraid. Not only do you not have to worry about that danger, but you're not even going to experience the emotion of fear. Because when your trust is centered and settled on God, so great is your confidence in his security that fear doesn't even enter into your mind. Because you know, my God will protect me. My God will guard me. I don't have any hope in myself. I don't have any resources that I'm relying upon. I'm coming to God alone. And he says, you will not be afraid. And then he lists four dangers in verses five and six. The terror by night, the arrow that flies by day, the pestilence that stalks in darkness, the destruction that lays waste at noon. And you should know that these words, none of these are, are specific dangers. The idea is they all are general threats of life. It might refer to some sort of surprise attack at night, some battle that comes at you in the daytime. Verse six could be speaking again of, of a disease, some kind of plague. They had epidemics in those days that often fell and thousands would die. But so the idea of verses five and six is, listen, the care of God is such that night or day, it doesn't matter when, night or day, God stands guard. He's, he doesn't go to sleep. He's always awake. He's always watching over you. Nobody catches him off guard. You can't sneak behind him and attack the Christian. He says day and night, day and night, 
He repeats it twice, verse five, verse six, because he wants you to know as a Christian, you've got comprehensive protection. And then in verse seven, it, it's like as the psalmist thinks about it, he gets confident. And his confidence kind of rises to a crescendo and he starts actually waxing poetic here. He gets figurative and he says, a thousand may fall at your side. This is hyperbole, right? This is exaggeration. He says, 10,000 may fall at your right hand, but it shall not approach you. And this scene, if it's real, then it's like, maybe there's this ginormous battle and the enemy is attacking massively and the arrows are raining down. Everyone beside you is dying. They're falling down dead. Thousands, tens of thousands. This is a slaughter. And he's saying, this is danger close, by the way. That word side means hip. Like right here, like right next to you, inches away. And your right hand is obviously part of you, right? It's attached to you. So he's saying, this danger is wiping out everyone around you. But not you. In fact... It won't even approach you. It's not going to come near you. It's not going to come close to you. And then in verse 8, as if to underscore, he says, you'll only look on with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. And, and in that verse, if you notice, he gives three expressions for sight. Look on, and then with your eyes, and then see. And the point is this. When you're a child of God and you place your faith in God, the most devastating forces may be unleashed against you. Everyone around you may die, but the power of God is able to not only let you survive, but thrive. To not only be a survivor, but a victor. And he says, you will look on as a spectator. So great is the security that God provides his children. And the implication of, of these verses thus far from three to eight as we look at the care of God is that you as a Christian have no need to be afraid. If God's character is such as verses one and two says, and his care is so extensive and exhaustive to protect you against all these enemies, then what have you to fear? What could, could this world throw at you that could hurt you if God is your protector? What could overwhelm the, un, the unbeatable God? What could get you? And he says nothing. So you can have peace, you can have calm, you can walk through day by day with that settled assurance that God is with me and everything is okay because he is my security. But many of you, probably all of you rather, you don't face threats like this in your life. You're not actually afraid that something might kill you or gravely harm you on a daily basis. So, so when you hear of pestilence and terrors at night and arrows, it kind of sounds like it's going way over your head and it doesn't apply to you. Because we live in Gilbert, right? Like armed mobs aren't coming at you. People aren't looking to kill you. So your fears aren't life-threatening. You're not afraid of things that'll take your life. But there are other fears that you face, I bet. How about the fear of the unknown? The fear of the future? You guys are in a season of life where either you're making, as high schoolers, serious decisions that are gonna affect your future. You're setting the trajectory for your life. You've gotta pick a major, a college, and that's gonna determine a career. And so that's an awful lot of pressure. And so some of you are afraid, I'm not sure I'm gonna get the grades that I need to get into the school that I need to achieve the life path, path and plan that I need. And that causes me some anxiety. And what if I pick the wrong major? 
What if I don't get into that school of business that I want to? And, and what if my grades aren't enough, say, that I don't get into that college of nursing at this prestigious place? And, and then my, my plan just begins to unravel and that perfectly constructed path of life doesn't happen. What if I don't get that job offer when I graduate in a year? What if I don't get into that next program or master's degree? See, those are the fears that cause you anxiety, the fears that trouble you. But for a bunch of you, it's a relational fear. Man, maybe you're not quite as worried about your job future, your career. Maybe it's relationships. And you say, I have prayed for so, so long to get married. Where is he? Where is she? God, I've always wanted to be a husband and a father, a wife and a mother, and I'm waiting and I'm waiting and I've got this image from when I was a little boy, probably a little girl, if I'm honest, since I was a little girl. Because all little boys are thinking about is shooting each other with the sticks. At least I was. But I bet you ladies, you can relate to this idea, most of you, that from so long you dreamed of being married and you want to be a mother and you want this and yet now as life comes and the years turn and that you say, when God, when? When are you going to bring the right person? I don't want to live life on my own and take care of myself. Like, I don't want to be working in the business world. I want to be a mom. And so when is this going to happen? This is my fear that my prayers will amount to nothing. And here's what this psalm says to you. God speaks to you and he says, fear not. He says, you can shelter under my wing. I have space for you. He says, trust me. Come close to me. I will shelter you. I will protect you. You don't have to know the future. I write the future. I know what's coming for you. And he says, trust me. Just trust me. I'll be your security. Even if the future is uncertain, I'll be your security. Verse 9, the psalmist re declares his confidence in God. You've made the Lord my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. And verse 10, it's this sweeping, sort of all inclusive statement of protection. No evil will befall you, nor will any plague come near your tent. And this is the idea of your home. So you'll be safe in the place where you want to be the safest. Home. That one safe space from everything. He says it really is a safe space because I'm the one who guards it. It won't even come near. I will protect you. And he gives the manner of this protection in verse 11. It's angels. He will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands that you do not strike your foot against a stone. Whoever would have thought that God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, would create angels and send them forth as ministering spirits for your sake, for the sake of his elect. Hebrews 1.14 says angels are ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation. So as tempting as it is to, to read into this, we've got guardian angels. That's not what it says. But what it does say is the almighty God of heaven who controls countless legions of angels, he sends them, he dispatches them on your behalf to protect you to bear you up in your hands, to lift you above the fray so that you don't strike your foot against a stone, so that you don't run into an obstacle in this life. 
And you'll remember that this, this verse is the very one that Satan, in Jesus' temptation in the desert, Matthew 5, or rather Matthew 4, verses 5 and 6, that Satan twists this and he says, Jesus, this isn't an invitation to trust. This is an invitation to tempt God. Just launch off the temple. God will protect you. And so Satan twists what is intended to give you confidence. And Satan twists it as a way for Jesus Christ to test God. But believer, you ought to know that there is great comfort that God has assigned his angels to care for you. In verse 13, you will tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you will trample down. Those aren't meant to be literal lions and serpents. Those are metaphors for the dangers of life that come at you. You will trample them down as a conqueror. Step all over them is the idea here. Now before we move to the last section, I need to give a disclaimer. Because if you're hearing verses 3 to 13, you may say, I'm untouchable as a Christian. Nothing can harm me. No sickness, no danger, no disease. I'm literally impervious to harm. I can do whatever I want. And if you think that, you'd join a long line of faith healers and word of faith preachers who preach that same thing from this same text. And they tell you, well, let me just tell you what one of them says. Joseph Prince, he's uh, out of Singapore. He's a word of faith healer or a word of faith preacher. He says this. This is off his website, mind you, about Psalm 91. This is how he sells Psalm 91. I quote, Danger, trouble, and evil may pervade the world, but as God's child, total round-the-clock protection is available to you. Find out how you and your loved ones can enjoy 24-7 protection from terror, viruses, and any kind of evil, seen or unseen. Wow, that's amazing if it's real. I'm going to spend the $9.99 to get that sermon. (laughs) Is that what Psalm 91 says? Like, is that the promise for us? Because if it is, that's amazing. You guys, if you're a Christian, are untouchable. But that's not what it says at all. That is a gross distortion of God's truth. And what it does is pervert and cheapen an amazing message. Because it makes God your genie. And you just rub the lamp and you tell him what you want to do. God, you protect me from everything. Thanks. That's not what this says. That's not what the New Testament suggests, by the way. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal happening among you. As though something surprising were happening. Expect trials. They're going to come as a Christian. This doesn't say God will perfectly, always, continuously protect you from every harm. What it says is, he will, has the power to protect you, but when he deems necessary, he will let harm come to you because he does good out of not good. Romans 8.28 says, everything that happens God works together for good to those who love him. And then all the way back to Genesis, Joseph, he says to his brothers when they sold him into slavery, he says, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. Even the cross of Christ in Acts 2, Peter says, you put Christ to death in the most heinous act of evil ever, but God used that to bring salvation to the world through our Savior, Jesus Christ. So God turns the arrows of evil into instruments of good. And that is what this this psalm is saying. God has the power to protect you. But this is not a guarantee that you can do whatever you want and God will always save you. Because in his wisdom, in the perfect mind of God, his inscrutable wisdom, sometimes he deems that you need to suffer so that good may come. But your confidence is this. This comes to me from a God who loves me, from a God who is using bad to produce good. So I can trust him. Yes, it may not 
feel good. Yes, it may be uncomfortable. Yes, I may not like where I'm at, but I know God does good out of not good. And I can trust him. And when he chooses, he can protect me from every danger. But if he doesn't, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will not worship you, king. We will worship him alone, even if we must step into the fire. That has to be the attitude of the believer. Let's wrap up in this final section. Verses 14 to 16, we see God's commitment. This is this final reality that's unmovable, and it provides the basis for such security for the Christian. And it's interesting, in verses 14 to 16, God speaks. So it was the psalmist in 1 to 13, but now, almost as if to say, in case you wondered if this security is too good to be true, now I'm going to affirm it personally. I'm God Almighty. And so God speaks in 14 to 16. Context makes that clear. And he gives eight commitments of care to his children. Eight commitments of care from the mouth of God. Words of comfort, words of confidence meant to instill hope in you. Verse 14, because he has loved me, therefore I will deliver him. The first promise is deliverance from danger, which we've already seen. But note that this comes to the one who has loved me. And there is such a special sense to that word loved, a bunch of words for love. This one is a love of attachment. You could say the one who clings to me. Like new lovers, new married couple. They're, they're always together, right? If you see them at a restaurant, they're sitting next to each other, even though it's weird because like you have to crank your neck to see them. But they sit next to each other. They're holding hands. His arm's probably around her. She's got her head on his shoulder. And they're just so close. And that love glitters in their eyes. And you can just tell they're something different. And then you find out because you see a ring and you say something. And they're like, oh, we just got married. And that's that picture of that clinging love of attachment. It's a love that says, I chose you. I'll never leave you. I want you. You're mine. I'm yours. I'm not going anywhere. That's the love that God says, I respond to that love. I deliver the man who loves me like that. I set him securely on high. Here's the second commitment. I will set him securely on high. I'll place him above the trouble. I lift him out of the fray, out of the problems, and I'll put him on a high place where no one can touch him. Why? And listen, just see this reciprocity here of relationship. I will do this because he has known my name. Which almost ties back to verse, verses one and two. He says, I will set this one on high. I'll protect him because he knows me. This isn't a promise for all of creation. This is for those who are my children, for those who know me, for those who I, I have this intense, personal, intimate relationship with. This is not casual acquaintance relationship. He's not saying I do this for the folks who, who say like, oh yeah, I'm on Sundays sometimes. I read my Bible when it's convenient. He says, no, this is for the Christian, for the one whose heart is bound up in mine, for the one who loves me, who knows my name. He says, I will set him on high. Verse 15, he will call upon me and I will answer. And you have the promise as a Christian that your prayers will get a response. The answer is not always yes, but he says, I'll hear you. I will respond to you. You're not crying out in the dark. Your prayers aren't bouncing off into space. He says, I hear them and I'm storing them up and I'm going to act on them. I will respond. And so the Christian's confidence is, my God hears me. Every prayer he hears, and he will respond. And I will be with him in trouble. You could say, I'll be with him in distress. And that is so precious, that promise of God's presence. When a child is afraid, what does he do? He runs to his parents clings to his parents because that's safety. God says, run to me. I will be with you. And that is a with, that preposition. It has this implicit idea of nearness and closeness and relationship. So this is, I will be with you like I'm right by your side. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here for you. 
And he says, I'll rescue him and honor him. And finally, verse 16, with a long life, I will satisfy him and let him see my salvation. So for the believer, the one who loves me, knows me, calls upon me, he's gonna have a long life and a full life and he's gonna see my salvation. And that word really just speaks of a comprehensive idea of rescue, physical and spiritual. But the beauty is that we know that in the end, we will experience God's salvation. Those of us who are saved, he will pull us from this earth. We will be with him forever in heaven. And we will experience his presence, his perfect presence forever. And we know that this won't be because of us. It's not because we somehow conjured up enough love or that our prayers were sufficient or that we called upon him enough or we, we gathered enough knowledge about him from the Bible and, and thus we've earned it. We will see his salvation because Jesus Christ is our champion. Because Jesus Christ did what we could never do on the cross. He lived that perfect life. He took the wrath of God. He rose triumphant from the grave. And so for those of us who have placed our faith and trust in him, we will see his salvation forever because of what Christ our Savior has done. And that is the immeasurable security that you have. You've got security in this life, but you have eternal security because of what Christ has done on your behalf. So this psalm is so much better than a safety net. This psalm is the unbreakable, unshakable power of God on your behalf to care for you, to protect you. And it doesn't stop when you die. It actually just gets started. You will experience his perfect salvation forever. It's for this reason that the hymn writer said, a sovereign protector I have, unseen yet forever at hand, unchangeably faithful to save, almighty to rule and command. Christian, these are words of comfort for you. We have an absolute security in our God. And that is meant to give us confidence in this life, to walk boldly for his glory. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your sweet words to us in Psalm 91. May they embolden us to live for you. May we rest upon them as a pillow. May they comfort our hearts. May we love you and serve you. And may we give all the credit to Christ who has accomplished our forever salvation. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's continue to sing to him. Sing about his holiness and his faithfulness. It is in Christ alone and through Christ alone that we have that eternal security. Thank you, Jeremiah, for that sermon. Now let's sing this together.
Still love. 